Here we go. I chose uh, the word that jumped out at me this week. The word that jumped out at me as I read that text in Galatians was the word free. F-R-E-E, free. And, you know, I've been having fun the last three weeks playing with words, idioms, and all those kinds of things. And so it just, it just hit me, and it, it looked, looked like a good place to start. So let me ask, is anybody out there brave enough to share a definition or what it means to be free? Anybody? What's it mean? Tell me. Unrestrained. Unrestrained. Okay. Another one? Without encumbrance. Do you have a PhD? <laughs> another one. Anybody give me another one? At the earliest service, someone said, do whatever I want. Well, none of those are incorrect, right? But as I look further, what I found is they're not the only ones. You know, uh, you can be a freeloader. <laughs> You can get a free pass. You can be a freelancer. You can get a free ticket. You can shoot a free throw, right? You can get in your car and drive down the road and get on the freeway. <laughs> and if you're really, really rambunctious and courageous, um, and you, I'll let you do it right now if you can, you can stand up and sing Free Bird. A Leonard Skinner song, right? So, you know, like all the words I've been talking about, and I think I had like 15 or more on my notes, there are a lot of ways to use and apply freedom. I suspect, though, the majority of people probably think in their own minds, uh, I don't have encumbrances, there's no powers over me, I can do whatever I want. When Jean and I were in Egypt right after the revolution about a decade ago, you know, they were experiencing what they considered freedom themselves. Uh, our tour guides, tour guide kept inquiring, asking questions of me. He says, well, how does the justice system work in the United States if you're free? I said, well, you know, you get arrested, you get a trial, and if you're committed or uh, if, if you're sentenced because you're found guilty, then you can appeal. He goes, appeal? What do you mean, appeal? If you're guilty, you're guilty. Chop off your hand. So, you know, freedom, freedom is, is not a particularly clear kind of thing. But I think most people probably interpret it as, I can do what I want. I'm free. Well, that's not exactly what Paul is describing here in terms of this freedom, this freeness that is so important. This being free in Christ, which was a new experience, was about living a different way, living in a different form of community, one that did not discriminate between, as he writes in uh, Romans, between male and female, slave and free, men and women. That it was in another place, he said, and a colony of heaven on earth. A recreation. He talks extensively in Romans about uh, in Adam we were created the first time, in Christ we're recreated a second time. So, you know, this thing he's talking about is forming a new community. And the freedom they have is not freedom from their masters or the powers that uh, they feel oppress them or over them, not freedom from, but freedom for. Freedom for living a Christ-like existence. Freedom for being different. Freedom for looking at your neighbor and not seeing what distinguishes you from them or the way they talk or how they think and all those things, but focusing on what you have in common as a child and a creation of God. That is a whole different way of thinking. And he had a lot of problems with that. Um, at one time, you know, they would serve the agape meal. Well, the agape meal was every time they gathered in these small households, they ended with not merely uh, the Lord's Supper, but a, but a small feast. And, of course, people in those churches start fighting at who would sit in the best seats. <laughs> and uh, Paul said, no, we're not going to be that way. You know, you can't preach to the world 
if you're acting like the world. There's a different set of values and a different way of, of promoting community and society that is godlike. He ran into problems, of course, with uh, these goyim, these Gentiles, that he was inviting into the faith over the subject of kosher food and circumcision. Uh, those were big issues, and um, past or, or those who came out of the Jewish tradition were very concerned that to become a follower of Jesus, you had to first become a Jew, hence the circumcision thing. And of course, once you become a Jew, then you have to keep the laws. Now bear in mind that the laws that Moses got, the Ten Commandments, can anybody stand up and recite all ten? Anyway, never mind. Uh, they were over 600 by the time of Jesus. It's like us, you know, we have misdemeanors, we have felonies, you know, it's not good enough to break the law, we have to break the law down. And so there were all kinds of laws that you had to keep, including what you ate. You couldn't eat shellfish, go to Leviticus. You couldn't go to shellfish. Uh, women at a certain time of the month could not come to the temple. Uh, before they came back to church, they had to go to the priest and say, well, this month is done, I, I wanna come back to church, and the priest had to say, okay, you're good. <laughs> My fundamentalist friends, when they say, you know, you gotta do everything in the Bible that it says, I always say, well, when was the last time you went to your minister and confessed that your monthly cycle was done? You know, <laughs> the laws get very, very fussy. In fact, there's a humorous book out there where the wife of a, a, a rabbi wrote, he said, I'm gonna keep the laws specifically for one year. One year, I'm gonna keep them. And his wife became so angry that during that particular time of month, she sat on every chair in the house. <laughs> Which, by Jewish law, meant he was on the floor. Anyway, those are the laws that have been removed. But in removing them, you know, whenever laws are, are taken away, it actually puts more responsibility on us. When you have laws, it's easy to say, I kept it or I didn't, right? But when they take it away, that is all on you. You know, no matter what law they put in place about speed limits, I am probably always going to be a breaker of those laws, right? Whether I abide by them or not, that's me if I'm willing to pay the price and, and so forth. But, but what I'm saying is to be free and to be free in Christ means you are free now to do what you should. You are free now to take what you uh, what you confess or say he was all about and now live it out. And that is far harder. I tell you, that is far harder than having someone tell you what to do, what you can and can't do, you know? I can be a good citizen because I do, do this. Really? Okay. I had a seminary professor who said, you can always tell a society when a society is out of control by the number of laws they have. That when things start going crazy, we just pass more and more and more laws, and um, I don't know, we keep thinking that's gonna work, it never does, because that, that what the change is not something outside of us, it's not something that can be forced on us or legally binding, it only matters when it's in here, when you choose. You choose because of your values, your acceptance into the community to live that way. So these Pharisees, these keepers of the law, the interpreters of the law, come to Jesus, they come to Jesus justified. They caught this woman in adultery and of course, they're playing tricks with him, but they're saying, by law, we should stone her. We should stone her. And they're well within their rights. And Jesus kind of flips it around on them and says, well, yeah, go on ahead. Go on ahead, do that. You have the right to do that, but, but do it if you've never made a mistake, if you've never committed what others call a sin, if, if you've never had these things happen, and go on ahead, you be the first to pick it up and throw it. And the text says they all went away. 
because they knew better. They, they knew what was going on. And besides, you know, there's a couple, couple things. I have a couple questions this text always brings to my mind. They brought the women, but where was the man? <laughs> um, another use of the word free, he got off scot-free, right? Jewish law in those days, let me tell you how it worked. If a woman screamed, then it was rape. If a woman screamed and nobody heard her, it was consensual. That's how the law read. Jesus simply, he doesn't judge her. He doesn't ridicule her. He kind of recognizes that, you know, all of us have broken laws, done, done things that maybe we regret. He just says, do better. Go and sin no more. Have respect for yourself and others and receive grace. That and the other, this all hit my mind and uh, I just ask you to step into my shoes as a pastor to leave yourself behind and to step into my shoes, my profession as a pastor. Because I was very troubled this last week as, you know, the Supreme Court made several rulings. Seeming to me that, you know, guns have more rights than women these days. That's just an opinion, scratch that, you know, it's just an opinion. But it, it troubled me as a, as a pastor because um, I think of all the situations where women, you know, w women for a long time couldn't even talk about hysterectomies with their male pastor. You know, you didn't even talk about, they'd, they'd say, you know, I have a, have a female issue. But women that have come into uh, my office to discuss what is a very personal, intimate situation where they're pregnant, by different situations, and none of them are often, none of them are the, the stereotypes we hold of people in that situation so often. Uh, you know, women in their early 50s who have a family or are older and just thinking at that age is not fair to anyone. College students who've come and, you know, either they made a poor decision or had a situation forced on them that was not wanted. They're already struggling. They already have enough emotions and without doubt carrying some, some guilt. They, are always seem to be made the guilty one. And they, they just want to talk. They don't, they don't really want me to tell them what to do, and I don't want to tell them what to, to do. I just want to be with them like I'm with all of you on different situations, trying to pastor and share, and, and know that whatever conclusion you come to, God still loves you, and I will still be here for you. Because God knows they have, they have enough pain already. Just imagine being in my shoes now, wondering who won't talk to me or who's afraid of what I'll say or what happens or whatever else. And it brings back to mind, I've shared it before, and um, I know more than a few of you have heard this story, um, but I have to tell it again, and this time I promise I'll give an ending. <laughs> uh, so people bugged me last time I didn't give an ending. But I have to share it because it's so poignant, and um, over my 40-year career, there are a few situations that just haunt you stay with you, change you forever. Young couple in one of my previous churches who came in to talk to me. Um, they had a beautiful little girl. 
I've described. Her father was of Hispanic background and mother was Caucasian. This beautiful, beautiful little girl with the biggest brown eyes you can imagine. She looked like a precious moment statue. And she would sit beside me at the children's message and it, you know, it was just, they were just good people. Beautiful child. Well, when they became pregnant with the second child, it was born with all of its internal organs backwards. Nothing was where it's supposed to be. And the doctor told them that the chances of this child living, I don't know, six months, a year, were slim. I don't know, I think the child may have made it to two, Jane. No, not two. Anyway, the, the parents, loving the child, took on that responsibility and cared for it and carry, carried that child and did everything they could for that child. And the child went through multiple, multiple surgeries as doctors tried to switch things around and make things right. So as the child grew, there was room and a place for our internal organs to function. I baptized that child in the operating room of a downtown Chicago hospital with its chest open as they did the last surgery, which failed. After an appropriate time, or what for them was an appropriate time of grieving, they came to me and they said, Keith, we would like to consider having another child. We have this beautiful little girl, and on the other hand, we had this situation that happened, and they had gone to all the doctors, had all the studies done, and they discovered that, I, I don't know if it's, you call it their DNA or what, but their chances of having another child, either way, were 50-50, or maybe higher. They knew that if she got pregnant, they might get lucky and have uh, another perfectly healthy baby, or they might have another child as the one they lost. Keith, what do we do? Well, it's really not my place to tell them what to do, because whatever they do, they have to live with that. I, I walk away, I'm done, you know? I said, the important thing is that you know what the options are. You know what will happen. They decided to take the risk, have their own baby, and when they did the tests, that baby had the same problem as their last one. and they're back in the office, what do we do? Now these are good people, these are faithful people, these are people struggling with everything and the issues and the intimacy and, and you know, there's no perfect way to handle this. They know what it entails for them and for everyone around them as well as the child. What are we gonna do? They made the, because there is no, like I said, there's no easy decision here. They made the choice not to follow through on the pregnancy. What I can tell you now is uh, following that, uh, they adopted a little boy. So that little boy has I think he's probably 18 by now, maybe older. That little boy has grown up in the most loving family he could ever fall into. And the parents move on knowing, knowing that it, you know, that was a difficult thing, but that they did the best they could and worked on and tried to be understanding and compassionate for themselves and, and all, all the way through. You can't, these kind of things are so personal and so intimate, you know, we think we can pass laws and just, you know, then everybody's gonna do it, do the right thing. In those kind of situations, I'm not sure what the right thing is. I, 
I am sure that I have people in front of me that just need to be loved. And they don't need to be stoned. And I hope for the best possible outcomes. And it is then that I imagine I know what Jesus wrote in the dirt when he got down and scribbled away several times before that woman. He says, where are your accusers? They've all gone away. And he writes, in my mind, he writes, and don't forget, I love you, and God does too. Amen. Oh,